Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with true hearts and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. I now ask you before God, is this your sincere confession that you heartily repent of your sins, believe on Jesus Christ, and sincerely and earnestly purpose by the assistance of God the Holy Ghost, henceforth to amend your sinful lives, then declare so by saying the Lord. Yes. Upon this, your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.
rule and govern our hearts and minds by thy Holy Spirit, that being ever mindful of the end of all things and the day of thy just judgment, we may be stirred up to holiness of living here and dwell with thee forever hereafter, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. First reading of Holy Scripture, appointed for this, the second to last Sunday after Trinity, is written in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, reading from verse 9 to verse 11. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your devout attention is also now directed to the Epistle lesson for this Sunday, recorded in St. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, reading from verse 3 to verse 10. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These sh shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day, to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Here ends the epistle. He shall call to the heavens from above, and to the earth that he may touch his people. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God is self-destruct. Hallelujah, hallelujah, the ransom of the Lord shall return. And come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their hands. We shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and silence shall be away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. According to St. Matthew, chapter 25, reading from verse 31 to verse 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, 
and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you person, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Here ends the Holy Ghost.
grace, mercy, and peace be you from God our Father, and from our dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The last judgment of Christ is a public vindication, a judicial affirmation of the veracity of his word and preaching. Now, vindication is, by the by, proof that someone was in the right. And so the events of our gospel lesson serve as vindication, first, for Christ himself. Second, for the believers and members of the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. And finally, for the sentence passed upon the unbelieving and ungodly. We heard Jesus say in our text, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now, the Lord here isn't just framing the setting of the last judgment, but he's actually vindicating himself and demonstrating his divinely appointed authority as judge of all. Notice that Jesus refers to himself in this context not as the Son of God, which of course he is in truth, but he calls himself specifically the Son of Man. He wants to emphasize his true human nature because it is as a true human being that he will judge the world. In St. John's Gospel, the Lord says this, As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Now in today's super subjective culture, in which empathy is touted as the most virtuous quality a person can have, we often hear people say things like, you can't judge me, you don't know me. You don't know what I've been through or what I've had to deal with in my life. You have no right to weigh in on this subject because you're this or that. You, because you may be white or because you're not a woman or because you may not have personally experienced everything that someone else has, you're told that you have no right or ability to render a righteous judgment on anyone, that you cannot say what is right and what is wrong. Now, people not only levy this charge against their fellow human beings, but even against God, thinking that God is so far above us, so far removed from our plight in this world, he can't possibly know what it's like to be one of us. And so they actually try to strip God of his authority to judge them. Well, this is ridiculous on its face, since God, as the creator of heaven and earth, is the highest authority by his very essence. But this charge is also shown to be false on account of the incarnation of our Lord and Savior. Christ isn't given authority to be the judge of the living and the dead because he's the Son of God, but specifically, as we heard in John's Gospel, because he is the Son of Man. He knows exactly what it's like to be human. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. He was, in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. He knows exactly what it means to be judged, because he was judged on our behalf. He suffered the curse of the law, he suffered the pain of hell, and he endured the wrath of God against sin in order to be our Redeemer and the Mediator of the New Testament. And so this is another aspect of Christ's vindication on the last that when he comes again, it will not be the same as when he came the first time in humility, but he will come in glory. We're approaching the Advent and the Christmas season of the year when we think about the Lord's first time. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He came to serve. He came to suffer. He came to die. His glory was hidden from the world. Glimpses 
only seen by selected apostles. He was seen by the world to be a noble. He was judged by the world to be a sinner, being numbered with the transgressors as he hung on the cross. But when he comes again, he will not come to suffer and die, but to judge and to rule. He will be seen by all, even by those who pierced him, not as they judged him to be, but as he is in truth, the true incarnate Son of the Father. As the writer to the Hebrews says, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. And Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, and to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In fulfillment of the prophet Daniel, the fullness of his glory will be on display for all to see. The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with all his holy angels and sitting on the right hand of power. This will be the vindication of Christ for all the world. But there is another vindication found in our gospel lesson this morning, that of the church, the true believers in Christ. Matthew says, Matthew writes, The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came. Now this is not something that the Lord will say in private, behind closed doors or anything, but openly before all. As Christ was despised and rejected by the world during his first advent, so all true believers endure tribulation and hardship in their life. In more violent times of years past, generations of believers suffered all kinds of physical and political persecution. Even today, while we might not suffer the same kind of violence as the saints of old did, Christians are still being persecuted, our culture today is growing more and more intolerant of Christians. We're trolled in the media and made the butts of jokes by pseudo-intellectuals. In this perverse and sexually immoral climate of our country, we're called every name in the book. Sexist, bigoted, racist somehow. This phobic, that phobic, even Nazis and fascists. All because we're endeavoring to live according to the sound biblical principles of God's word. Now, it would be one thing if we actually espoused violence and hatred against our fellow man. If we returned evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, these are things which the Apostle Peter teaches us not to do, but to follow the example of our Lord and Savior. If we did these things, then we would be suffering as the unrighteous. But if we suffer for righteousness' sake, then we show ourselves to be followers of Christ. And so this is why the vindication of the righteous on the last day is so important. It encourages us to know that the Lord knows our afflictions and has not forgotten. He knows that the world's judgment against us is false, and he will judge us to be in the right. And his words will convince the world that those whom they have persecuted are the children of the Heavenly Father. Now because this is a public testimony before the judgment seat, Christ points to the good works of his kingdom. That we have fed the hungry and clothed the poor. That we have visited the sick and remembered those who are in prison. Now here we have to make a very important distinction. While good works are necessary in the life of the Christian, since we have been created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of doing good, while that is true, we do not teach that good works are necessary for salvation. Salvation, together with our justification and the forgiveness of our sins, 
is a free gift of God, earned for us solely by the merit of Jesus Christ alone. Likewise, we do not become God's children by our works, but as St. Paul teaches us, we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. By our baptism, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, by the gift of faith worked in us, by God alone, we have become blessed. So when the Lord praises the church for the good they have done in their lives, he is not saying that by those works they have become blessed children of the Father. Instead, it is by their works that they have shown themselves to be his children. In other words, the works that are called out here in this text are descriptive and not prescriptive. In this public setting and judgment of Christ, he doesn't point to what is in our hearts, but he points to our external and public behavior. And so, for this reason, we should be careful to maintain a life of good works as the public testimony of our faith and of the salvation which we have even now as our inheritance. Now, the final vindication we have in our text is of the sentence passed on the unbelieving and the ungodly. Then the king will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The very things that Christ praises the Christians for is what he accuses of the unbelieving. Notice the differences in the responses of the sheep from the goats. While the believing humbly ask when they supposedly ministered to Christ, only to have Christ affirm to them that by serving their neighbor they served him, the unbelieving argue and ask when they supposedly did not minister to Christ. When didn't we do these things? They ask. It calls to mind the story of the rich man and Lazarus. How the rich man had every advantage in life, and yet he selfishly served only himself. But let's take their question in earnest. Let's say that there are many unbelieving people in this world who are very charitable, philanthropic even, and spend a lot of their time and money helping the poor. Are these works truly pleasing? Well, from a purely external and civic sense, yes, these good works are good and helpful to a person's neighbor. But as I've said, a person's works do not earn his salvation. They do not make a person right with God. In the book of Hebrews, we read that without faith, it is impossible to please God. If good works do not flow freely from a hard faith, done according to love for the Lord and for the praise and honor of his grace and mercy, they count for nothing in his sight. Now Christ says something else which is very important for us to consider. Namely that the everlasting fire to which the ungodly are sentenced to endure was not prepared for it was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now what we learn from this is that God created no one for damnation. He elected no one to destruction. But that it is really and truly his earnest intent that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the hellfire that awaits the unbeliever is something which men choose for themselves, that is, by despising and rejecting the grace of God, earned for them by Christ, and really sincerely offered to them in the word and sacrament of the church. Now, as we approach the end of the liturgical church year, Let's take stock of our status as the children of God. Because it is he who endures to the end shall be saved.
Let us be careful to continue in the true faith unto our end by our regular use of God's word, by the right use of his holy sacrament, because by these means the Spirit works to preserve us. And as we know that the Lord will point to the testimony of our faith on that day, we should take to heart the words of St. Paul to Titus, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good faith. By his grace alone, we will continue. And to his praise alone, may we all be found gathered together among his believers on that last day, assembled on God's right hand, to hear those precious words. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through abiding faith in Christ Jesus unto life. Almighty and most merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thee thanks for all thy goodness and tender mercies, especially for the gift of thy dear Son, and for the revelation of thy will and grace. And we beseech thee so to implant thy word in us, that in good and honest hearts we may keep it, and bring forth fruit by patient continuance and well -being. Most heartily we beseech thee so to rule and govern thy church universal, with all its pastors and ministers, that we may be preserved in the pure doctrine of thy saving word, whereby faith toward thee may be strengthened, charity increase in us toward all mankind, and thy kingdom extend. Send forth laborers in thy harvest, and sustain those whom thou hast sent, that the word of reconciliation may be proclaimed to all people, and the gospel preached in all the world. Grant also health and prosperity to all that are in authority, to the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of this state, and to all our judges and magistrates, and endue them with grace to rule after the good pleasure, to the maintenance of righteousness, and to the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. May it please thee also to turn the hearts of our enemies and adversaries, that they may cease their enmity and be inclined to walk with us in meekness all who are in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, especially those who are in suffering for thy name and for thy truth's sake, comfort, O God, with thy Holy Spirit, that they may receive and acknowledge their afflictions as the manifestation of thy fatherly will. And although we have deserved thy righteous wrath and manifold punishment, yet we entreat thee, O most merciful Father, Remember not the sins of our youth, nor our many transgressions, but out of thine unspeakable goodness, grace, and mercy, defend us from all harm and danger of body and soul. Preserve us from false and pernicious doctrine, from war and bloodshed, from plague and pestilence, from all calamity by fire and water, from hail and tempest, from failure of harvest and from famine, from anguish of heart and despair of thy mercy, and from an evil death. And in every time of trouble, show thyself a very present help, the Savior of all men, and especially of them that believe. Cause all needful fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season. Give success to the Christian training of the young, to all lawful occupations on land and at sea, 
and to all pure arts and useful knowledge, and crown them with thy blessing. Receive, O God, our bodies and souls and all our talents, together with the offerings we bring before thee, for thou hast purchased us to be thy own, that we may live unto thee. O Lord Jesus, who callest unto thee all that labor and are heavy laden, to refresh them and to give rest unto their souls, we pray thee, let these guests experience thy love at the heavenly feast which thou hast prepared for thy children on earth. Keep them from impenitence and unbelief, that no one may partake of this holy sacrament to his damnation. Take off from them the spotted garment of the flesh and of their own righteousness, and adorn them with the garment of the righteousness purchased with thy blood. Strengthen their faith, increase their love and hope, and after this life grant them a place at thy heavenly table, where they shall eat of the eternal manna and drink of the river of thy pleasure forevermore. These and whatsoever other things thou wouldst have us ask of thee, O God, grant unto us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of Jesus Christ, thine only Son, our Lord and Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen.
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to the Almighty God that thou hast refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we beseech thee that of thy mercy thou wouldst strengthen us through the same, in faith for thee and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without Lord, lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. 